Hello and welcome to episode 218 of the Say Yes to Holiness podcast. This is Christina Simmons, your host, and it's been a minute. It's been a few weeks since the Eucharistic Congress happened uh, in Indianapolis, and we are nearing the end of the 2024 uh, Olympics that are being held in Paris. And it's in the midst of all of this that I kind of wanted to reflect a little bit about the value of community as we're on this pilgrimage, as we're on this journey. Um, And this applies to me as well, as my husband was in the hospital and uh, going through that and then the aftermath and um, good results, uh, you know, recently uh, when we went to the oncologist, for those of you who are following along, um, you know, my journey as I, I uh, accompany my husband on his cancer journey. Um, but the fact is, is that community, in order to be able to become fully who we are created to be, and also for us to achieve the greatness even in the eyes of the world, it takes a community. So without further ado, I wanted to share some food for the head, heart, hands, and feet that might be able to help us understand that we are not alone. Not just that God and his angels and saints are with us, but that we are in connection, in union with others around us, even if it doesn't seem that way sometimes. So... Our food for the head actually comes from Pope Francis. He wrote, It is impossible to believe on our own. Faith is not simply an individual decision, which takes place in the depths of the believer's heart, nor a completely private relationship between the I of the believer and the divine thou, between an autonomous subject and God. By its very nature, faith is open to the we of the church. It always takes place within her communion. We're reminded of this by the dialogical format of the creed used in the baptismal liturgy. Our belief is expressed in response to an invitation, to a word which must be heard and which is not my own. It exists as part of a dialogue and cannot be merely a profession originating in an individual. We can respond in the singular, I believe, only because we are part of a greater fellowship, only because we also say we believe. I think especially in America, we will move towards the I believe, you know, this and you can believe that. We forget how important it is that we have commonly held beliefs. Now, in this case, of course, Pope Francis is talking about our faith in God and the faith that we profess. But it still gives us insight into why there is so much division and, uh, you know, there, there is so much angst. I mean, we're in the midst of a political season uh, here in America. It's also been an eventful few weeks after the end of the Republican National Convention, uh, where Trump accepted the national, uh, the Republican uh, nomination. It was the longest speech ever. Um, but anyway, um, in the wake of that, uh, President Joe Biden made the decision that he was going to withdraw from the presidential race for 2024. Uh, and Vice President Kamala Harris uh, took on that role and subsequently has been going out and campaigning. So in the midst of all of that, we wonder why it is that one person believes one thing and another believes another. And a lot of it is because we don't have commonly agreed upon set of beliefs. So that's in secular society. But in church, we do. And there is a power in that. When we profess our faith and we do it in union with others, so like when we go to Sunday Mass, there is power in that. 
we can see that power on display at the Olympics. Team. This is the essence of team. When we believe that we can win, then I believe it, you believe it, we believe it. But it's also about, I believe in you, and you believe in me. And a lot of people will use, you know, talk about team, you know, the acronym, you know, team stands for together, everyone accomplishes more. And this is true. Within team, within community, we become our best selves, or at least we should. And this is why we're on this pilgrimage. This is why we are struggling day after day to be able to respond that, yes, I believe. Yes, we believe. Yes, it's not just about a private relationship. It's not just about, think about the analogy of a cross. It's not just about the vertical between me and God. It's also the horizontal between me and my brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus tells us, what are the two great commandments? To love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In order to love our neighbor as ourself, we need to be in union with them. We need to profess. Now, does it, you know, profess our belief together? Now, does this mean that if we disagree on things, that that means that we can't be in union with one another? No. Most of the times, what we disagree on, if you get right down to it, is that how do we get someplace? We agree on where we're moving towards, but we disagree on how we get there. That's most often the most common human disagreement that, that we run into, even if we might think that it's more. But within church in particular, this is the case. So we need to keep our eyes upon the fact that we are church, that we, I and you, are part of something greater than ourselves. And because of it, we are capable of being able to become the saints that God created us to be. And we are surrounded by saints, but we, our vision is clouded. We can't see it. And that's a great challenge. That's a great challenge that we have to come before our Lord and say, Lord, I only can see the issues that my brother has. I can only see the splinters in his eye, and I can't see the plank in my own. But I still believe. So we believe that we can become saints. We believe that God desires us, that he invites us into union with him. He desires us to become all of who he created us to be. And when we profess it and we do it together, we can achieve miracles. Our food for the heart comes from Melissa Keating. She wrote, A pilgrimage is an allegory for our journey to heaven. That means we should invite heaven into it. If you're doing a planned pilgrimage, there's likely going to be many religious experiences built into it, but you should still make ways and make time for the ways that you personally are drawn to pray, much as your accommodations allow. So, for me, this means taking time to meditate on scripture. For others, it could mean journaling, praise and worship, spiritual reading, whatever works for you. But regardless of this, make sure to make time for the sacraments. Confession and Mass are always good choices, but they can be quite palpably beautiful on a pilgrimage. This last little you know, advice that she gives us is so important on our own pilgrimage. Yes, we go off on pilgrimage. I have done it several times in particular. Last year, going on pilgrimage uh, to bike the Camino de Santiago with my husband. Um, and what a absolutely profoundly transformative experience that was. 
And that bleeds into our daily pilgrimage of life. This is the value of going and being intentional about taking pilgrimage, about getting away from the day-to-day and to go and be attentive to um, going to holy places, going to places of the saints, um, going to a place, for example, where Our Lady um, has appeared or uh, that uh, many others before us have traversed like the Camino de Santiago. When we do that, we are following in the footsteps of our brothers and sisters who have come before us and also those who will come after us. We become, in a visible way, a part of that communion of saints. But along the way, we need to be attentive to praying and we also need to be attentive to the sacraments especially confession and mass. When we do this, when we're on pilgrimage, it is especially beautiful when, so for example, going to mass at the, um, at the uh, Basilica uh, in uh, Santiago, the cathedral in Santiago, um, when we got to the end of our pilgrimage, uh, that, that was just magnificent uh, in Compostela. Uh, and, uh, you know, and you remember those moments and they help you when you come back home and enter back into the day to day and you go to your local parish church and it helps you be able to step back in to those moments to remember them, but then to have your own day to day enriched by those because you are different. And we become different, even if we don't notice it, each and every time we go to confession and receive the Lord's mercy, and when we go to Mass and receive Him, body, blood, soul, and divinity, we slowly become transformed. And if we're able to hold that vision before us of how we're on pilgrimage and that we're journeying to heaven, and we keep that in our mind, then Mass becomes something totally different for us in our day-to-day. It does become something beautiful. This is what we're trying to do for, for our lives, for our spiritual lives. If you go to Mass more frequently, you have that opportunity to practice. And then when you come to Sunday Mass, when it's very evident that you're there with your brothers and sisters, then it's that occasion again to be able to uplift them by your inner transformation that's going on. When we are making time for the sacraments and we need to be intentional about making time for them, hopefully you already have into your schedule, built into your schedule, that weekend mass is just a part of the schedule. It's just like, okay, and everything else works around. Okay, when am I going to Mass? But we also need to make time to go to confession regularly, at least once a month. I know that seems like a lot, but the fact that I can attest to the power of going to frequent confession, it helps us reset. It helps us be able to be open to the graces that are present, especially within the Eucharist. But then also making time for prayer, making time to either spend time in Lectio Divina or to pray the rosary or to journal or to listen to praise and worship music or to do spiritual reading, all of those things. Whatever it is that is where you are connecting with our Lord and spending time in quiet, conversation with him, you need to make time for it. You need to make time for it. Our food for the hands comes from the letter that Pope Saint, now Saint Pope John Paul II wrote concerning pilgrimage to places linked to the history of salvation. And he wrote this, in this journey, Through the places where God chose to pitch his tent among us, great is my desire to be welcomed as a pilgrim and brother, 
not only by the Catholic communities whom I shall meet with special joy, but also by the other churches which have lived uninterruptedly in the holy places and have been their custodians with fidelity and love of the Lord. More than any other pilgrimage which I have made, the one I am about to undertake in the Holy Land during the Jubilee event will be marked by the desire expressed in Christ's prayer to the Father that his disciples may all be one. John 17.21 A prayer which challenges us more vigorously at the exceptional time which opens the third millennium. For this reason, I trust that all our brothers and sisters in faith, in a spirit of openness to the Holy Spirit, will see in my pilgrim steps in the land traveled by Christ a doxology for the salvation which we have all received. And I would be happy if we could together in the places of our common origin to bear witness to Christ our unity and to confirm our mutual commitment to the restoration of full communion. Again, this is bringing back to the fore that we are not on this journey alone, that it is within the context of community that we find Christ. It's not a personal quest, but, and it's not made alone or in isolation. And our world tends to isolate us. That's how Satan works. He loves to divide us. He loves to get us to set aside people, to not embrace them, to not allow them on, into our journey, to get us to think that because they're different, that means they can't understand. All of us, regardless of whether or not you're a sports fan, all of us can understand the joy of someone achieving a lifetime goal, a goal for which they have worked, they've sacrificed you know, blood, sweat, and tears. We all can identify with that. How? Because each of us, in some way, has done something that we have done well and enjoyed doing and brought us great satisfaction. It could be something as simple as doing a garden in your front yard, or it could be cooking dinner for your family. Wherever it is, that you are finding joy in the doing, you're enjoying doing it, and you think you do it pretty well. It doesn't matter whether or not anybody else thinks you do it well, but you think you did it well, and it brings you great satisfaction. It's in these moments that we are finding God, of where we are connected to the commonality of the human experience. This is why I think the Olympics are so appealing to so many people is because it taps into the great joys and the great tragedies that happen. Because there are tragedies that happen in the midst of the Olympics. Someone falling, uh, someone getting hurt, someone getting sick, um, you know, because normal life is happening in the midst of, you know, trying to compete. And in the midst of competition, things go wrong. And even when we give everything, we come up short of the medal stand. We come up short and don't receive a silver or a bronze or especially a gold. And we have to always remember that we're not experiencing this on our own. And again, this is a reason why the Olympics, I think, are so appealing is because it's a worldwide activity. So many billions of people are focused upon the Olympics, and that unifies us. So the actual reason for the Olympics was to bring you know, the nations together in order to be able to bring about peace. Is that when we're united in a cause, then when we're all sending our athletes in order to compete, you know, yeah, there's national rivalry, and you know, and you saw it with the Americans, the Australians, and in, in the swimming events in particular. But there's all sorts of rivalries all over the place. But the fact is, is that we are in union together. This is no more important than within church, and we make this journey together. Why do we go to those holy places? Because it's special to go to the places where God pitched his tent or where holy people have been. 
or where our lady or Mary has appeared and has given us messages from her son, you know, messages to help us draw closer to her son. All of these places help us be able to uh, have a larger openness to the Holy Spirit. These are things that um, help us be able to bear witness to Christ, but especially help unify us, help us be able to find Jesus together. And when we do it with our brothers and sisters, when we are helping them be able to see Christ, this is the essence of what the National Eucharistic Revival was about. Yes, 60,000 people came together, and it was such a beautiful sign. It was a visible sign of palpable belief that people have in especially the Lord in our Eucharist during those times of adoration, during the Eucharistic pilgrimage, you know, down through downtown Indianapolis. But the fact is, is that we are to help one. That's the motto right now, walk with one, that came out of the National Eucharistic Pilgrimage. So often we can feel overwhelmed and say, what can I do? And you can walk with one. So like, for example, why do I do these podcasts? If I can help one, if I can help one of you out there be able to draw closer to Jesus, to understand that he loves you, he cherishes you, he wants you to come to him, to strive to do all that you can so that you can come to be with him for all eternity because that's exactly what he wants. That's what he created us for. If I can help one person do that, it's worth this time. And this is sharing the gifts with my brothers and sisters. So this is what we are called to do. So think about what is what are those times where I'm enjoying doing something and I, th- I, I think I do it well and it brings me great satisfaction. It's in those moments that you're finding the eternal. You're finding God in those because you're doing fully exactly what he created you to do in that moment. And you're doing it for your brothers and sisters. By being your best self, you're doing it for your brothers and sisters. Our food for the feet comes from St. Augustine. He tells us, Our pilgrimage on earth cannot be exempt from trial. We progress by means of trial. No one knows himself except through trial, or receives a crown except after victory, or strives except against an enemy or temptations. St. Augustine just described perfectly what is going on at the Olympics right now in particular. It's a trial. Whatever the Olympic, you know, the athletic event is, it's a trial. It is a struggle. It is a challenge. And at the end of it, you know yourself. You know, did you give your best effort? You know Did I come up short? You know, was I able to overcome adversity? You know, were my myself and my teammates, especially in the team event, were we able to come together and be able to achieve together? And you received the crown. We on pilgrimage, we as believers in Christ, St. Paul talks to us about it, of the crown of salvation. Christ has given this to us, but to be able to put on the crown, to be able to have it for all eternity, takes striving against the enemy, against Satan, against temptations, and going through trials. And no one is exempt from trial. No one. No one is exempt from trial. Our world wants to tell us there's an easy button. (laughs) There's not. So I'm here to tell you today that just because there isn't an easy button doesn't mean that it's going to be overwhelming and it's going to beat you. 
No. The victory has already been won, but we have to trust in that victory. We have to trust in the power of our Lord. We have to throw ourselves upon him and say, Jesus, I trust in you. We have to say, Jesus, I give it all to you. Take care of everything. We have to do this so that he and his power is able to flow into us so that we can be a part of his team and he can help us accomplish more. He can help us become more because that's the whole point of this journey. During the summertime, we can get a little distracted because our schedules tend to not be quite as different. The days are beautiful. We're out and about and we're trying to enjoy the weather and you know to do all the various things that are out there that we can do. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we have to remember that this too is a season that we need to still be attentive to those things that are going to help us continue on the journey. Going to frequent you know, confession and to Mass, continuing to go to Mass is very important. Making time for that personal prayer. But to realize that regardless of the trials, in spite of the trials, but because of the trials, we can receive that crown. And this is what we are about. This is what pilgrimage is about. So, as we're finishing up our time today, think about some way. Think about a resolution that you can make. I just gave you a few of how it is that you can be reminded that you're part of a team. You are not alone. How can you live that out? You can live it out by making time for the things that are going to help you draw closer in unity with the team. Just like a team does practices, your practices are prayer and confession and going to Mass and trying to be a better person, striving for virtue each and every day and trusting your life to Jesus so that in the midst of the trials, you know that you are doing all that you can. And when you do those things, and you're going to come through. Right now, going through an extended marathon of a trial as I accompany my husband with cancer. I'd say that even though we had a, a great, um, you know, intermediate uh, visit with the oncologist, um, who said, hey, it looks like the cancer is kind of, you know, the treatments are working and the cancer seems to be kind of, you know, uh, at a, at a, you know, holding point. It's kind of like in a holding pattern, you know, so there's not massive growth going on, which is wonderful news. We're still closer to the end than we are at the beginning. And in the midst of this trial, I have never been more reminded of the importance of community, of the importance of journeying together on this pilgrimage. Friendship and the prayers and love of those who listen to my podcast and reach out and to my YouTube channel. And they meant so much. And thank you for them. If you haven't heard me say it before, thank you. I can't do this alone. You can't do this alone. So that's my great prayer. Is that whatever wisdom you might find in these conversations. That... It's wisdom that helps you be able to do whatever it takes. So together, we can tell the master of death, not today. And you can become that saint that God created you to be. God bless.